Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rick Lee, and I'm the director of the of Global Programs and Partnerships at Rutgers Global. On behalf of all my colleagues at Rutgers Global, I would like to welcome you to the Global Collaborative Education Lab Symposium. It's really lovely to see so many familiar and new faces in the audience joining us. Thank you for making time. Um, before I, we begin, I would like to extend a few thank yous uh, to Rick Garfunkel, Vice President for Global Affairs, for encouraging the Rutgers Global team to think creatively about how best to support our faculty and students with virtual exchange opportunities. Next, I would also like to thank my colleagues at Rutgers Global who have been enthusiastic partners in developing G-Cell, to Dan Waite and the study abroad team, and in particular, Lauren Marigali Ferrer, Rocio Ruiz and Lauren Williams, to Catherine Roscoe and Christina Miles and the communications team, to Marcelo Marigali Ferrer and the Latin America Initiative Unit, and finally, to the small but mighty programs and partnerships team, Joanna Bernstein, Greg Costales, Kim Pernice, Alexis Davidson, and Lauren Forsman. And of course, a huge thank you to our colleagues in the teaching and, with, and learning with technology colleagues, uh, Will Pagan and Dina Novak, and all of our pro faculty presenters. So a few housekeeping items first. This, how, uh, the house symposium proceedings are being recorded. Um, if you do not want to appear on camera, please turn off your camera. Please also mute yourselves during the presentations. Um, I will go over the agenda, but before I do that, I would like to invite Rick Garfunkel to say a few words. Thanks, Rick. Um, welcome to uh, a year like no others. It's uh, certainly a crazy year, painful year for some. It's not over yet. An educational year for many of us. Uh, for those of you that are a little bit new to us, I remind you who we are. So again, my name is Rick Garfunkel, Vice President of Global Affairs, and I run a unit called uh, Rutgers Global. We have uh, actually several subunits, uh, one of which supports the, the eight or 9,000 international students at Rutgers, uh, 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 plus uh, uh, another unit on scholars who, who help support the 1,000 or 1,500 international scholars. Think of postdocs and faculty. We have um, another unit that uh, oversees the partnerships. We have uh, over 300 active partnerships right now with partners around the world. Uh, study abroad unit, which um, it, back in the days when we could travel, did uh, about a thousand or so, send about a thousand or, or so kids uh, abroad every year. Uh, we support dozens of faculty research experiences uh, with, with seed grants uh, every year. We have dozens and dozens of programs on campus, on all of our campuses. Think the Mandela Washington Fellows or Fulbright Scholars or conferences, mini conferences or events like today's. And now, of course, we all pivot like you. Um, in our case, this is meant for the study abroad office, bringing all the kids who are abroad last spring home quickly. Uh, it meant supporting international students here in the spring when we went virtual. It meant supporting the international students who are abroad and stuck outside of the US now, in uh, many cases in their home countries. Um, and the ROSE program, which is the program that we're running right now for 400 students in China, for 400 Rutgers first year students in China is one example. Uh, there's another one that we're in discussion about, we're calling it study abroad at home for the second semester where we'll support many international students in their, in their home countries and sort of match them up with local partner universities where they can take classes so they don't have to be 100% online. Uh, so we are making sure that we support uh, global events and global education as best we can. The pandemic, the uh, climate change, and, and many of the of the major um, grand challenges of our time are global in scale. And so today's event introduces one class of ways that, that, we, uh, that we hope to help Rutgers organize itself and think of its global engagement uh, and education. So uh, we're talking today about what we're calling the, uh, the Global Collaborative Education Lab or GCEL and some examples of what are sort of ongoing and that we would like to let people know about what each other is doing and what we're proposing in this in this sphere. Uh, so it is it's um, G cell is uh, by the way it took it took about five names to come up with the name G cell. That's another story in itself. Um, five meetings. Um, G cell is uh, is is a way that we're thinking of encouraging faculty to adopt virtual exchange and virtual collaborative education. Some schools know parts of what we're calling GCEL as COIL, 
COIL is collaborative online international learning, and that was uh, le led by uh, a SUNY team. So anyways, the purpose of this uh, today's event is to bring a group together to, to find out what we're doing and to figure out how we can help you and uh, you can help coordinate e each other and support each other uh, as, we, as we enter and presumably remain in sort of a, a virtual, virtual space for some time and even as, even as travel comes back. A big thank uh, again to Rick Lee and the partnerships team uh, for bringing this together for study abroad and TLT and the communications group for, for also helping. Let me turn it back to you, Rick. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Rick. Um, and, you know, just a reminder that, you know, uh, as Rick mentioned, that we hope that uh, we're going to uh, encourage faculty to embrace virtual exchange, uh, but not as a replacement for study abroad to be used only during the uh, pandemic, but really as a kind of a long term set of methods to expand opportunities for students uh, to help them become globally engaged citizens without requiring international travel. So uh, we're looking forward to, to hearing some of the presentations today. Uh, we've invited several faculty this afternoon to share their exciting and innovative engagement with virtual exchange. Joanna, can we get the agenda slide, please? So today's agenda will be as follows. In the first hour, part one, uh, we'll have an introduction to virtual exchange and uh, global collaborative learning. Um, and then also a uh, presentation including the resources and services offered by the Teaching and Learning with Technology Office in the Division of Continuing Studies. Uh, so Rocio Ruiz and uh, Dina uh, Novak and Will Pagan will be presenting in the, in, in, for the introduction. And then afterwards, we'll have uh, three faculty, uh, four faculty members who will share models of traditional virtual exchange. So presenters will include Maite Green and Gary Farney from the History Department at Rutgers Newark. Laurent Brulion from Mechanical Aerospace Engineering. And finally, Haruko Wakabayashi from Asian Languages and Cultures. Um, part two, between one o'clock and 1.30, we'll have uh, faculty presenting uh, models of what we're calling non-traditional virtual exchange. And in this panel, we have presenters include uh, Ula Berg from Anthropology and, and Latino Caribbean Studies and her collaborator, Soledad Alvarez Velasco, a postdoctoral fellow in comparative cultural studies at the University of Houston. And our final faculty presenter will be Kyle Farmbury from the School of Public Affairs and Administration at Rutgers Newark. Part three, from 1.30 to two o'clock, uh, during the last hour of the symposium, several members of the Rutgers Global Team will share additional information about opportunities and resources. So we will have several Q&A sections uh, after each of the parts. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat, so feel free to ask your questions and drop them in the chat, or better still, wait until the presentations are concluded and pose your questions during the Q&A. So to begin, I would like to invite Rocio uh, and Will and Dina to start us off. Thank you, Rick. Uh, for those that I haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Rocio Ruiz. I'm the program manager for short-term and faculty-led programs in the Office of Study Abroad. And in the next few slides, I will quickly go through the foundations of virtual exchange before our faculty presenters share real examples that they are working on. As it was mentioned earlier, some of you may have heard of virtual exchange also by the name of COIL, which stands for Collaborative Online International Learning. The way it works is through collaboration between a Rutgers faculty and a colleague in a different university abroad. The two faculty will develop a syllabus together or just part of their own syllabi. There's a lot of flexibility around the process and really it will come down to whatever works for the specific courses. The idea is to design five to 12 weeks of collaborative work between the Rutgers students and the students at the partner university. The two courses do not need to be the same as long as they complement each other. So it doesn't have to be business here and business in um, Spain. It could be a business course at Rutgers with a language course at another university. And then throughout the semester or the five weeks, 10 weeks, um, however long the exchange is, students exchange, engage in dialogue and collaborate on project work, inviting uh, each other for input by using familiar or preferred social media form um, instruments or online platforms or learning management systems. So why engage with virtual exchange? 
Well, virtual exchange is an engaging and practical way of introducing a global component to your course. And as we will see with the examples from faculty in a few minutes, virtual exchange opens the door to exploring global aspects of the topic being taught. And it's also a way to provide students with lim limited resources to travel abroad with global exposure. And additionally, it's a way to create a new re relationship among faculty and universities. And it could also be the precursor to a physical exchange after completing the course. The foreign students could travel to New Jersey and do a final presentation at Rutgers, or our students could travel abroad, and Rutgers Study Abroad can help plan for a program like this. Who are the people involved, the stakeholders? It's a Rutgers faculty member collaborating with faculty abroad and the students in both universities. Rutgers Global, our whole team, and TLT can assist in the design of the course, as we'll see in the next few slides. So how can Rutgers Global help? We can help you identify a potential colleague at a partner university. Uh, we can provide access to faculty and member institutions through the SUNY COIL Center Global Partner Network. We can also assist in the design of icebreakers that address cultural differences and perspectives for the students to connect. Um, and then once tra international travel is resumed, we can also assist with planning and organizing the in-person visit or exchange. And um, for the next slide, I'd like to introduce Dina Novak, who will also detail how TLT can help. So yes, um, my name is Dina Novak. Um, so I'm part of the Office of Instructional Design, uh, along with Wilpgan, the Director of Instructional Design. Um, and so we are part of a team that can help with the course design and development aspect of this. And so what that looks like is sort of focusing on those learning outcomes, thinking about what do we want the experience to be, what do we want the outcome to be for the students who are involved in this? Um, and then we can provide some guidance along the way to sort of help you make decisions about the best way to accomplish those outcomes. And so what this process looks like can vary depending on the project and the needs of the partner that we're working with. So in some cases, we're there to provide sort of those one-off consultations. You just wanna think through something or thinking through the proposals or thinking through a particular activity or assignment. Um, but also this can be a much more long-term partnership. Um, ideally, a course design project takes place over the course of a full semester, where we sort of start, um, as I'll talk about a little bit on the next slide, we sort of start with those outcomes and then we work backwards from there um, in a really iterative collaborative process where you bring in your content expertise and we bring along some of that technology pedagogy expertise to kind of meet in the middle and find the best solutions to help you and your students accomplish what it is you want to accomplish. As part of that, we can also help guide the selection and use of technology. So the technology is there as a tool to help um, facilitate certain experiences in the online environment. And so choosing the right tool for what you're trying to do is something that we can kind of help um, guide. Um, can you flip back just one more real quick? <laughs> um, so one other resource um, that we do have as part of the larger TLT team, we also have um, a team that help support the creation of educational media. So if you wanna create some more high quality videos, we also have a team that does game research, immersive design, AR, VR. Um, and so we can also help connect you with some of those resources um, for more in-depth projects like that. Um, so our contact is at the bottom. Now we can go to the next slide. <laughs> um, so just to talk a little bit more about the process and the approach that we use for course design. So as I mentioned, we start with the outcome. We actually start at the end. So the first thing that we'll think through is what is it that I want students to understand, to know, to be able to do at the end of this? How are they going to be different at the end of this experience? And then thinking back to that sort of project-based component, we say, all right, what is it gonna look like? How will we know that they can do that thing? How will we know that they have met our goal? And so we start with the sort of assessment of that learning and that growth and design a project or something that's gonna help us know that students have achieved it. And then from there, we work backwards through the rest of the experience to figure out the particular experiences and activities and even sometimes materials that are going to help them prepare for and really be successful in meeting those objectives. And so that sort of last stage is when we start to select some of that technology and figure out the right tools and technologies for the job. Um, so yeah, that's, that's our process. That's our approach. That's how we can help. Thank you, Dina. And I'll take it back for a few more slides. Um, Joanna, can you please go to the next one? And I'm going to talk about designing the course itself. Next one, please. There you go. Um, so the first part of the project would be to design the syllabus together. 
or part of it, as I mentioned. That would be the first discussion. The faculty has to have to decide if um, the whole course will be taught together or just part of it. Um, but a minimum of five weeks of combined coursework and assignments is recommended. Um, faculty must also include as part of their syllabus time, enough time, maybe a little bit extra time for the students to connect and to work together. And um, a couple more details, each faculty member grades their own students and each student receives credit at their own institution, which makes things easier. After several months of teaching online, I'm sure, Rutgers faculty have all considered the different techniques to succeed in their courses online. But when teaching a virtual exchange course, you add another layer, the cultural differences, students who have English as their second language, time differences, different higher education systems that come with classroom etiquettes and expectations that are different, and in some cases, unreliable technology. So faculty need to anticipate possible issues and ask themselves, what will I need to to do to shift my teaching style so that the collaboration between the group members can happen. And on the screen, you just see some examples that you might already be familiar with, but then you also have to examine them in the context of the cultural difference. Icebreakers are one of the first key steps in virtual exchange because it's important for the students to connect, to trust each other, and to form those groups for collaboration. And you will ask yourself, uh, well, you and your faculty partner would work to develop these icebreakers. And you will think, will our icebreakers be synchronous or asynchronous, um, as well as the course itself? The nature of the course is going to determine the need for one or another or a combination. There are pros and cons for each one. Um, synchronous has face-to-face -face engagement. There's an opportunity to discuss real time. But of course, there's the time difference. Um, students with English as a second language might be at a disadvantage. So the breakout rooms can always help with this um, and even dividing the students in smaller groups that you usually would. The asynchronous activities also gives time maybe for, um, to translate the text for other students to prepare if they're going to be participating in a different language, um, but it is very passive. So all of these things are things that faculty need to consider, uh, plan with their teaching partner, and we can also help you work through those questions. Um, as a little tip, I also think that this is an opportunity to teach American students to not expect English as the default language for every activity. Um, and uh, an idea is like when creating a landing page for the course, you could have information in both languages side by side. That's always interesting to see. Um, cultural perspectives. I already touched on this a little bit, but a faculty could consider including in their syllabus a few activities addressing these cultural differences. The screenshot that you see on the slide is from a TED talk by the author Chimamanda Adichie. It's called The Danger of the Single Story and her experience as an international student and writer. It's available on YouTube and it's an easy way to introduce a conversation about stereotyping before or in the beginning of your virtual exchange course. This is just one idea. Um, and one example of, of uh, things that we can provide, Rutgers Global and TLT can provide for faculty that need ideas on how to address these things. They might have not thought about it before. Um, and developing cultural activities. How will you address intercultural learning? Um, when teaching the course, you can anticipate some issues among the student groups who may have different views on teamwork or academic work. So how will you address these? A good way to prepare in advance is for the, to have the students develop a contract for their group setting the rules for collaboration. They can develop it together and it's interesting to see the different inputs and, and expectations from, from uh, different groups of people. Um, and finally, in the same way, icebreakers are an essential way to connect the students. It's also recommended to add a closure activity or a goodbye activity. Um, another thing that we and TLT uh, and Rutgers Global can help with. And now with this, I'm going to pass it back to Rick Lee um, to introduce our faculty presenters for today. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Rocio and Dina. Uh, next, our first facu uh, facu set of faculty presenters will be Maite Green and Gary Farney who will be presenting on New Rutgers New Works Initiative with the University of Huelva in Spain. Thank you so much, Rick. I'm waiting for the presentation to come up. Thank you so much. Thanks to Global for putting this together. This is really great. I wanted to talk very briefly about an initiative that I'm trying to start with the University of Huelva in Spain. Uh, for many years, probably 10 years, I've been trying to 
put together or figure out how to do this co-teaching. And it seems like COVID has made this possible for good or for bad. But um, what I want to do is if you can please uh, uh, turn to the next slide. I am teaching, I teach a course on uh, Islamic Spain. Um, I have taught it, this is the third time I teach it um, at Rutgers, if you can uh, move the slide, please. And um, last year I was on sabbatical and I was invited by a colleague and dear friend Alejandro Garcia San Juan to come to his class and to uh, uh, talk about my area of expertise. And we started talking about how it would be possible to do more collaborative work. And so a few months ago, he wrote to me because his university in Huelva just started a pilot uh, program exactly like this. And he asked me if I wanted to do it with him because he was teaching his course on Al Andalus uh, this semester. And I said, yes. So we are uh, beginning to develop this course this semester. It is a trial. We're going to see how it works. But um, he is an expert on the history of early Islamic Spain. And I work on the later periods of Islamic Spain. So we thought that it was a really good, nice combination. If you can please move the slide. Next slide. So we are teaching a course on the history of uh, Islamic Spain. Um, he starts his course next week, so our course is not going to be uh, exactly the same number of weeks working together. It's going to be about six uh, sessions, but we want to draw on some of the areas of expertise of both of us so that our students have um, uh, learn about the history of Al-Andalus from experts in both the early and uh, the later periods. But for us, what is important is to, for students to have access to an international education experience while at Rutgers and while at uh, Huelva. He's teaching his course in English to Erasmus students, so this was a good opportunity. And some of the ways in which we're gonna have our students working together, in addition to me giving lectures to his, his students and he, him giving lectures to my students and us sharing PowerPoints and other materials is that we have a collaborative project for our students. Um, they work in groups using a digital tool called Hypothesis to annotate texts. We're annotating, they are annotating primary sources. And so they will work in groups and our hope is that they can meet at least two or three times during the semester via Zoom in breakout rooms, uh, each group discussing the text that they have already collaboratively annotated asynchronously. And then we are hoping that in the final, as a final project, students will work in groups to create Wikipedia articles on uh, the subject of Al-Andalus, but that might actually be published in Wikipedia so that this will be a really good experience for them and they will contribute to uh, knowledge production. Um, if you can uh, go to the next slide, I wanna say very quickly that this requires a lot of planning and a lot of work, but also a lot of patience and long-term kind of uh, view. Uh, in addition to doing this uh, course this semester, I'm hoping that uh, I will continue doing this with Alejandro in other semesters and that I can establish an embedded component to this course where uh, we will, during the spring break, go to Spain, visit some of the places that we are studying, also go to Morocco and have Alejandro and his students join us for several visits um, so that we can have, they can have an experience that is virtual, but also they can go and meet their peers and uh, they can all learn together. I want to stop this uh, uh, description here and hand it over to my colleague Gary Farney um, because he's going to talk about other future projects that we have with the University of Huelva. Gary? Hello. So uh, could we have the next slide? So this is uh, what we were, what uh, Rocio was talking about, about being able to take an existing partnership like this that's virtual and turn it into something that where it's, you know, becomes a more traditional um, study abroad program. Um, we're toying with uh, developing with Huelva, as Maite said, an archaeological field school somewhere in near the Rio Tinto mines, which is in the province of Huelva. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Rio Tinto mines, they're in Andalusia. They're about 50 miles from Seville. They've basically been more or less con uh, continuously worked since uh, prehistoric times. 
and um, they're named after the Rio Tinto River, which you can see from the photo there is uh, actually stained by its proximity to the surface metals, which have always been there, which is why, you know, the site has been really been worked on since prehistoric times. Anyway, uh, Maite uh, and I, with a few colleagues, actually went to Spain in the summer of uh, 2019 to sort of look around. And the director of the Rio Tinto Foundation was had heard that um, I'm operating in a field school in Italy, and he was very eager to sort of suggest that maybe once Italy is over, we should think about starting one in uh, the Rio Tinto. And he showed us a site, which you can see us sort of investigating there to the right, which uh, is a Roman site, a Roman settlement site that would have been a Roman mining village, essentially, uh, dating from the fifth century to, the, from the, excuse me, the first century to about the fifth century, but maybe, you know, going a bit later in time. And uh, we sort of looked around, we, we realized that it's situated near a small town. The practicals all seem to be there. Maite has, as you mentioned, she mentioned to you, always wanted to develop some sort of program where we could have students visit sites. And we thought, hey, why don't we try to combine this together? And so having an archeological field school that's you know, part-time excavating, doing work on site and part-time going to see archeological sites and you know, sites of cultural interest throughout uh, Southern Spain, this could really work. So we're again, talking to, re to the University of Huelva, to the uh, foundation, and we hope to be able to put something like this together. Um, for the, could we have the next slide? Another idea that uh, we have been kicking around for a while too with our colleague in uh, classics and global, Professor Al Kuntar, who I believe is in this uh, session right now. We've been kicking around the idea of developing also an archeological field school in Jordan. This one would be a little different from the one in Spain. Uh, it would be archeological and heritage management. Um, but rather than having these necessarily be competitors with each other, these programs, we were thinking about trying to develop a way to make them run consecutively and kind of play off each other. So they would share some of the same staff and we hope we can convince students to sort of spend some time in Spain and then go to Jordan or vice versa to have the programs on consecutively so that students can sort of pass over me and sort of take, you know, three to six credits from Spain trip, three to six credits from a Jordan trip. And of course, we would uh, want to include Welva students and staff if we could, could with this. Anyway, we think this package together could be really interesting of having these different ends of the Mediterranean, having, have students have experience with archeology span and the material culture of both ends. Uh, sort of loosely tied in with the end of the Roman period. Uh, end of the Roman period, very interesting because of course it leads to, you know, uh, uh, the Visigothic period in Spain, but also an Islamic period. And of course into Jordan also an Islamic period. So that's sort of the idea we're hoping to develop through Maite's uh, Welva connections here. Great, thank you so much Maite and Gary. Uh, just a reminder to everyone that we will be sharing the recording uh, of the symposium proceedings. We'll upload it on the Rutgers Global YouTube channel, and we'll also be posting the PowerPoint presentations on the Rutgers Global website. Next, I would like to invite Laurent Bourlion from Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering to present. Yeah, so good uh, afternoon, everybody. So <clears throat> I've got a few slides, and first of all, I would like to thank uh, Rutgers Global, and they, really, they were really helpful to help me uh, propose this project. And so the project name is Dare Teach. So the aim is to build a drone, uh, some drone arenas, both in France and in the US, in order to propose a remote international teaching and learning experience to the Rutgers students. Uh, so next slide, please. So as you can hear, I come from France and I spend most of my life in France. And so that's why I've got some connections with Un University of Paris where I did my PhD in 2007, and also in Toulouse, in the south of France, when I used to work and spend a lot of time, and also I used to teach uh, in some uh, advanced uh, engineering schools uh, in Toulouse. Uh, next slide, please. 
So my main research topic is systems design and control. So that's something theoretical, close to applied mathematics, but we all do control every day. For instance, when you take your shower, uh, you mix the cold water and the hot water in order to control the temperature of the water. So uh, this is a, 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 a world topic and uh, uh, there are many applications and it's a transverse topic. Uh, so uh, next please. So from the theoretical point of view, it's exactly the same to control a rocket or to control the Segway. And next uh, please. And also there are many applications and control is a science that is remotely uh, uh, used because it is used for self-driving cars, so you don't need to touch anything. It is used in telesurgery when you remotely uh, uh, perform the operation. And it is used also for robots, and especially uh, uh, on Mars, you've got the Pathfinder rover, and so you remotely control it from the Earth. So that's a science that, that can really be used remotely. And that's also what I teach. So I use a uh, control uh, and I teach control and also I do some research on control. So as an intermediate between teaching and research, I really found very interesting uh, to use some drones in the last few years because drones can be very helpful to uh, illustrate some recent and advanced control uh, uh, research results. And at the same time can be used for teaching. So in my lab, for instance, we develop a few drones, uh, starting from small quadcopters to uh, fixed wing uh, aircraft, and uh, something in the middle, uh, uh, a VTOL, so something that starts and uh, take off like a quadcopter and then becomes uh, an aircraft. Next, please. So I was stuck uh, at home because of the COVID in the last few months, and so I started uh, looking at some uh, very small harmless drones named crazy flies. So they are off the shelf, we can buy them, we can program them. And so if you have a tent and a few uh, landing pads, you can program them and fly them uh, in a very small area, very small volume. So even in a worst case scenario, you could more or less put the tent in your garage and you would just need one human operator to, uh, to, to uh, monitor the drones and people could remotely control and program the drones. So next please. So that's why uh, recently uh, we proposed a new call with uh, friends. And so uh, this was because also there was a call from the FACE Foundation. Uh, so we responded to this call and we are still waiting for the result. But so we, we, we wrote a proposal with a central Supelec so Central Supélec is a part of Paris-Saclay, a very good uh, university, uh, high-ranking uh, engineering school uh, in France. And so I've got um, two uh, colleagues uh, at Central Supélec. So Sylvain Bertrand uh, is already well experienced in drones because he has proposed a drone MOOC uh, a, a few months ago. And Christina Manu is already also teaching uh, drones at Central Supélec. Uh, next, please. So uh, what, uh, what, what did we propose to the FACE Foundation? We propose a new course on the basis of drones. And the course will be run in parallel in France and in the US, so using Zoom, for instance. And will be for sure asynchronous most of the time because of the time difference between France and the US. But we will uh, use the same teaching material. And we will propose some project-based learning, uh, project learning experience to the students. And the students uh, group will be composed of French and American students. And we will have exactly the same experimental facilities in France and in the US. So some crazy fly drones in a small tent. Next, please. So the expectation, so from the technical point of view, uh, the student will learn how to control, to design a fleet of drones. And also they will learn to work in an international environment. They will work uh, I mean, everybody will speak English and they will uh, work in group. And the group, as I said, will be composed of French and American students who will propose a, uh, a, a work, uh, 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 sorry, a group contract at, at the end, of, uh, at the beginning of the class. And finally, there will be a final workshop in order to validate the results. So we hope to see a few and um, very interesting and entertaining videos of the students flying their drones. 
And there will be also a final session and we will invite some experts. Uh, next, please. So uh, there are also some perspectives. Uh, so for the moment, the plan is to work on small drones in a small tent. But then when everything will reopen, the aim is to do the same kind of thing, but with bigger drones and in a facility that we have at the School of Engineering, the Buller Flight Lab. So it's a 25 feet by 25 feet by 25 feet cage. And then maybe we could also fly outside. Uh, so that's for the technical point of view. Uh, next, please. So from uh, also another very interesting uh, perspective is to study abroad because uh, the French people at Central Superleg, they are required to spend one semester abroad. So in the UK, in the US most of the time. So after f following these schools, we expect that some of them will come to Rutgers. And at the same time, we also expect that some Rutgers students will desire to go to Central Superleg. Next, please. And there is also um, a possibility to extend and enrich the cultural exchange. And a very good intermediate, maybe between France and the US, could be the Canada. So we already have some connections in uh, Canada at Polytechnic Montreal or University of Concordia, and both of them, they work on drones. Of course, uh, within the School of Engineering, we could, we could include more faculty, and also we could work with the Big Ten Alliance. And in France, as I said, I also uh, used to work uh, uh, with Toulouse and the University of Toulouse. So, uh, so we could really enrich the cultural exchange, in, uh, have more people involved, and probably it would not be just a single course at the end, but a far bigger project with many universities working uh, and teaching uh, drones. Thank you, everybody. Merci, Laurent. Um, as Laurent mentioned, uh, he recently applied for a grant sponsored by the FACE Foundation and the French Embassy. So if faculty in the audience are aware of virtual exchange funding opportunities that they would like to apply to, uh, Rutgers Global and TLT would be very willing to assist and collaborate with you. So please keep us in mind. Next, I would like to invite Haruko Wakabayashi from Asian Languages and Cultures to present. Good afternoon, and thank you to Rick and Rutgers Global for organizing this exciting symposium. It's been uh, very helpful. I'm already learning a lot from everybody else's uh, presentations. Uh, what I would like to do today is to introduce two courses that I'm proposing to build um, on the partnership that's been established for some time with two universities in Japan, and those are Fukui University and Litsumeikan. So um, just to introduce you the two universities, the Fukui University is a prefectural university of Fukui. So it's sort of similar to the state university like Rutgers. Um, and uh, the first foreign student to Rutgers came from Fukui in 18, I'm sorry, 67. And uh, Rutgers alumnus, William E. Griffiths went to Fukui in 1870 to teach English and physics. And so upon that historical relationship, um, we had established a, an academic agreement with Fukui in 1981, which was re-established recently in 2017. With Nitsumeikan, uh, Nitsumeikan is a private university in Kyoto, but uh, we have had a spring and summer exchange program hosted by the political science department since, and I am not clear since when, but around 2000. And uh, this course is uh, scheduled to be transferred over to the Asian Languages and Cultures Department in uh, 2022. So starting with Fuku University, uh, we're actually celebrating the 150th anniversary of the relationship between Fuku and Rutgers uh, sort of over the course of two to three years, 2020 to 2022. Um, and we have been collaborating with Professor Duhe Hosoya at the School for Global and Community Studies at Fukui Universities. He's really been the key person uh, actively engaging in reinvigorating the partnership uh, between the two universities. So uh, this past spring, I offered an honors, interdisciplinary honors seminar titled Rutgers Meets Japan, um, Revisiting Early U.S.-Japan Encounters. And um, we, had, we had actually planned an embedded trip to Fukui and other parts of Japan, uh, which unfortunately was canceled. But uh, I created a website using Rutgers, uh, sites at Rutgers, 
And this is the front page of the website. And uh, since we couldn't go to Fukui, we instead um, had a Zoom meeting with Professor Hosoya's uh, seminar. And uh, next, please. We also um, did a collaborative map of Fukui, a historic map of Fukui, where um, our students sort of spotted some uh, sites in Fukui that we read in some of the primary sources and uh, put that on Google map. And we also asked students from Fukui to add on to the map uh, so that we have a better idea of what Fukui is like. And we are hoping that eventually we might have an opportunity to actually go there and see the sites that have been uh, described on this map. So uh, for fall of 2021, I am actually um, proposing a new um, ALC course, uh, which is a redesigned version of the honors seminar, which is catered more for the larger size uh, classroom. Um, and it is still under review. I am hoping that it will go through, but uh, I have been discussing with Prof Professor Hosoya on um, collaborating with his class. He's offering a project-based class uh, in Fukui with a focus on uh, the first Christmas party held in Japan, which was presumably hosted by William Griffiths at his home, which is pictured here, reconstructed in Fukui. So um, Professor Hosea is planning to reconstruct that and actually have a Christmas party there. Um, it would be great if we can participate, uh, whether virtually or not. But on our part, I'm planning to have the students do a little research at the William E. Griffiths uh, Special Collection at the Alexander Library um, on this event, if there are any good materials, and do a presentation of the materials on an online platform, uh, Zoom meetings with Fukui students, uh, and also, if everything goes well, um, we would like to also have an M optional embedded trip, a two week trip to Japan in January, uh, which includes five days in Fukui, uh, as well as visits to universities. There are other universities in Japan that have historic connections with Rutgers. Uh, so we plan to visit those as well. Uh, the goal of this course would be to learn about Rutgers early relationship with Japan and to share that history with our uh, Japanese counterparts. So the second university, Rizumekan University, uh, we've had a collaborative program for some time hosted by the Political Sciences Department titled Asia Pacific Relations in Multidimension. What they've been doing is to have a four week program on the part of Rizumekan where they send about roughly 15 students to Rutgers every spring for one month uh, and join the course that is held at Rutgers uh, and do group projects and whatnot. And then at the end of the semester, uh, on the Rutgers side, uh, we organize a two week summer program at, I'm sorry, I wrote Rutgers, it's at Nitsumeikan. So Rutgers students get to go to Japan and uh, join some of the students that came to Rutgers in the spring. Uh, we've been collaborating with Professor Keiji Nakatsuji at the College of International Relations at Nitsumeikan. Uh, next slide, please. So unfortunately, of course, Nitsumeikan has canceled the spring program for next year. Um, but he, uh, Professor Nakatsuji suggested that he can offer a special lecture on Asia Pacific relations. And um, we had canceled the Asia Pacific relations uh, class on Rutgers part two, but uh, I offer a class called Introduction to Japanese Culture. So what we plan to do is uh, to spend one month in April, which is the last part of the semester for us, which is the beginning of the semester for them, to work on uh, some collaborative uh, projects where we can exchange our perspectives on Asia Pacific relations focused specifically on war and memory. And if everything goes well, uh, the Rutgers students may be able to participate in a two week study abroad at Litsumeikan. So this will include group projects on war and disaster, memorial sites, uh, including Holocaust Museum and 911 Memorial in New York City, Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park, Yaskuni Shrine, and others. Uh, we hope to have Zoom meetings with Litsumeikan, have uh, students do group projects. But I think what's really important is to have this opportunity to have a discussion on war and memory and education and how the perspectives may be different uh, in Japan and the US 
And we, of course, have students from China and Korea and other countries too. So this will be a great opportunity to uh, be aware of the different perspectives in which the history is taught. Um, and I think that is all. Um, I guess, um, and we hope that this will be a transition to a more full course that will be offered in spring 2022. Uh, and I hope that both of these opportunities will open up more interest in participating in a long-term study abroad among the students. Uh, this is all new to me. And I think we're very fortunate that we have support from Global and TLT. So I'm looking very much forward to working with Rocio, uh, Dina and Will. Thank you. Thank you so much, Haruko. And thank you again to all of our presenters in panel, in the first panel. So we're gonna start the Q&A. So uh, Joanna, if you could uh, pull down the slide. Um, and those of you who have questions, please raise your hand or make yourselves visible. Um, oh, we have a question. Those of you who have a question, please raise your hand and I'll call on you. Uh, and give me a little time to make sure I get to see everyone um, on the screen. So please turn on your camera if you have a question. So in the meantime, maybe what we can do is, uh, uh, maybe I can uh, 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 ask Maite to elaborate more. You had mentioned, uh, Maite, uh, a resource that you used earlier. Yes. Oh, Maite has a question. Well, it was, I wanted to talk about that because um, someone in the chat had asked me about this tool hypothesis that right. I'm going to be using with the with the students, um, and someone asked me why not use Google Docs. Um, just uh, very briefly, this is the very first time that I'm using Hypothesis. Rutgers right now um, is paying for this tool, and it can be it's incorporated. You can find it on Canvas. Um, what I like about it and what students like about it is that they can underline, highlight the text, they can do the annotations and respond to each other's annotations. So I think for this type of collaborative work, this tool works really well. Um, I think this is a trial that Rutgers has right now, so I don't know um, if uh, enough people use it. I think they will consider uh, paying for it. So I think it's a great tool that is working really well right now with my students, especially to be able to work collaboratively. So I wanted to say that because someone in the private chat asked me about it. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that additional information. Other questions for our faculty presenters or to Dina uh, and Rocio? Yes, Raphael Smith. Hi, thank you for presenting. I just had a question with respect to um, student contracts and how that, how those are constructed. Um, I would just imagine that with different time zones, with just a whole virtual setting, like how do, I don't know, how do you engage people in that process or do you just kind of come up with it and people just sign it? Or I'm just wondering if you have thought a little more about like how to keep that process like as open as possible with the students and whether they can agree upon different terms or whatever in case something happened in their life during these projects. Just kind of go into like maybe detail, more detail on that, please. Rocio, can I call on you to maybe yes. address a little bit of? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I'll, I'll start. And then if Dina also wants to add anything. Um, so you bring up a good point with the time differences, but that is why the social contract, oh, I'm sorry, the, the student contract uh, should exist. So we are thinking that these are two groups of students that are used to working differently and have their own schedules and have their own um, responsibilities in their own uh, time zones. But it is, um, uh, ideal for them to at the beginning before starting their collaboration to say okay let's say if we have a project uh, due on Monday we are we're all going to do everything by Friday and that gives us enough time to work within our schedules or let's look at our time differences but maybe um, it's only a five or six hour time difference and we can find a time that works for everybody and we can also the students can also decide how they're going to communicate um, and we, we're not limiting the tools that they can use. So if they would rather Skype, if they would rather just email, work on Google Docs, there are many more tools out there that the faculty might not be aware of, but students are more in tune with that and they can decide how they're going to share their resources and work together. Um, it's also interesting to see how the classroom settings are different, um, how the, the different students 
uh, in, in different countries, they talk to their professors, uh, what their, that relationship is, is like, and for all of them to discuss all these differences and come up with a, a, a plan that works for them. Dina, do you want to add something? So the only thing I was going to add is just that um, it's helpful to make it really explicit that this is part of the project that this is sort of the first step in the project. It's an assignment. And in terms of sort of how they come up with it, as Rocio said, it's something that they come up with together. The group agrees on these different things. And for the instructor, it's helpful to sort of tell them, this is what you need to figure out. So you need to figure out your communication plan. You need to figure out your, your timing. Um, but also it's helpful to sort of have them plan ahead for what if things don't go well? What if we have a conflict? What if somebody is not meeting the expectations? What, are, what do we think the appropriate next step should be? Because a lot of times when students are frustrated by group work, it's because they have not communicated about that. And now one person is resenting, you know, this person didn't do what they were supposed to do. And it may have just been a misunderstanding about expectations. Um, so this really helps students get that buy-in, feel ownership, they've all agreed to this. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes some of those conflicts a little bit easier to manage. Um, and just practically speaking, the other thing that I would say is once they come up with their contract, they should run it by you. So you should approve all of the contracts and say, okay, this is good. Or, hey, I think you need to have a better plan for addressing X, Y, or Z. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Mike. You're Thank you so much for talking about the contract. Do you do, do you guys have any sample contract that uh, you can share uh, with all of us? Uh, yes, yeah, so we'll, there are some models out there, so we'll be able to find those resources as well. Um, and just you know, um, I forgot to mention our introductory remarks. So uh, virtual exchange or or uh, global collaborative learning or COIL, these are just terms um, that uh, we're using as well. But I think that you know. Uh, virtual exchange can be as, as flexible as uh, uh, inviting faculty to come visit for a class, things like that. So many of you in the audience are, or have already been working on this uh, for many, many years, uh, even before the pandemic. What we're doing right now is really systematizing a process. So I, I understand that many of you are already engaging with this, and I would, would invite those of you who are in the audience who may want to share other experiences that you've had. That would be great as well. So for now, I also want to encourage any other questions from the audience uh, for our first panel. We've got another five more minutes. I see a hand up, Asamina Pelligri, and then Marie O'Toole from Camden. Nice to see you, Marie. Asamina, uh, we'll start with you, please. Yes, hi. Thank you. Very informative and I really appreciate it. Um, I am actually in the same department with Lauren, and that's, that's really good to see that, you know, this is expanding. Um, I think that for us in engineering, a lot of us are working with other faculty throughout the world for research. And, you know, putting in the context of teaching is very, to me, it's very interesting, but also it's, it's foreigner. So I'm trying to figure out where do I start? Like, okay, great. I mean, I have designed my courses. I have designed the whole curriculum. I know how to do that. But, and I don't, I know how to do it for research. But when you're starting, you know, talking about exchange modules of the same class, that means that either you're creating a new course or Rutgers accepts that half of the course or how many weeks you're doing, they are going to be on the same ABET requirements, there are going to be a lot of, you know, like background that is the same. So um, how do you deal with that? Good question. So um, maybe I'll invite Laurent or Haruko to address those questions before you leave. Either, either one of you. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, so that's a very good question. And uh, of course, uh, so our plan is, uh, and so Alberto is uh, uh, okay with that, is to propose the course uh, to, under, to graduate students as a special topic in the spring. So at Central Superleg, they already taught this, this, this course in the past. So the syllabus will be more or less the same, but the background may be slightly different. But at the graduate level, uh, probably uh, it will be probably easier than at the undergraduate level to have the same kind of background. Um, and so um, my aim is to, to, to spend a lot of time uh, working on the, the the material and the course that they already have at Central Superlec, and also to discuss with them how we will program and fly the drone because we will, uh, I mean, uh, both of us, we will start using this type of drones. So for sure, there are, there are different things. Uh, the material of the class is probably almost ready in France, and I need to, to add my inputs and to, uh, to use it. 
And at the same time, the, the drones programming and how to, to set up the platform uh, is a challenge. And probably the first uh, group project will be dedicated to, to that. I mean, the, the student will help us to create this platform. Great, thank you, Laurent. Uh, Haruko? Uh, yes, in terms of um, sort of preparing the students with a background, um, the, the course that I will teach with the, collaborating with Ritsume Kan in the spring would be um, Introduction to Japanese Culture. And uh, since they do not start until April, uh, what I'm planning to do is use the first part of the class or the first two thirds of the class to really build on the background. And I will start with uh, something like teaching them Shinto and Buddhism and other traditional values which really are the foundations of some of the ways in which uh, you know, the war is per, uh, perceived, war or disaster is perceived as well. And hopefully by uh, April, when uh, the Japanese students join, uh, the students will have some um, idea of how the Japanese uh, have perceived, have the sort of traditional values as well as how the traditional values have um, affected uh, had an impact on how they view foreign others, for example, or a foreign enemy or battle or death in battles. Uh, and that would help them to engage in discussion with the Japanese students. Thank you very much. And Asamina, I would uh, suggest, I think it's, you've raised a really great question. I think if you already have a partner that you're do conducting research with, I would just work with that partner to find out what uh, to help design a course and have that initial conversation, uh, maybe even like stop a uh, visit each other's classes to find out what, what courses are available with the other, uh, with the other school. Yes, Asamini, you have a follow-up question? Yes, um, so I mean, I would love to do that. The question, it seems to me that, um, you know, the burden that is there for us is the ABET accreditation. So, you know, like if there were some resources about that, uh, if we knew, for example, what are the other universities internationally that are ABET accredited or there was a database, because, you know, like, it always going to come and bite us if we, you know, like, when we are going to go through evaluation. Definitely. And I think that's one of the resources that we will be able to provide uh, at Rutgers Global in terms of the partner matching um, and, and identifying the appropriate uh, schools and faculty members to offer these virtual exchange opportunities. So we'll certainly uh, be able to work with you on that. Um, um, and, uh, any other questions for Haruko or Laurent before they leave? If not, please join me in thanking Haruko and Laurent, um, and then I'll uh, 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 invite Marie to ask her question. Okay, um, I, I, fascinating presentations. Thank you very much. Uh, as you as you plan these events, uh, I noticed that you included Jordan, and in a project that I had previously, uh, risk management, but way, well before COVID, uh, risk management said that uh, they wouldn't allow students to go to the Middle East, including Jordan. So is, is there some kind of a, a list that's maintained or have, have you managed to maneuver around that uh, uh, restriction? So I'll, I will invite uh, Maite, but Rick, do you have any questions or uh, Rick Garfunkel, anything to add to Marie's question? Nothing, no. Is Gary here? Yeah, Gary's I'm here. here. Yep. Yeah, I mean. Sure. Um, we are sort of really in the initial stages of talking about this. Uh, Salam is uh, kind of the point person on it, Salam Al-Kuntar, and she, uh, we're kind of following her lead about what, you know, is and isn't possible. We haven't really cl cleared this as the global, global yet. This is sort of just us kicking around this idea and trying to relate it to uh, the Spain work that we're currently doing. Uh, I don't know if Salam's still on this, but she was a little earlier. Yeah, Salam is there. Salam, would you like to respond? Yeah, um, I am not, I actually thank you for uh, bringing this up because uh, last time I checked about a year ago, um, Jordan was not on a travel list that I could see, uh, like a travel ban. I know Iraq was, which, uh, I mean, the reason for where I picked Jordan, I'm, I'm more of a Mesopotamian archeologist, not Iraq, was because of this more safety issue for students. Um, so I'm not sure how to, um, if there is a, you know, it's, this is not ne negotiable because I could make a case for safety in Jordan. Um, it's one of the safest uh, countries in the Middle East right now. So 
um, but maybe we should look into that uh, pretty soon before we, uh, you know, make, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, really in, in in archaeological circles, I mean, it, like Jordan is like regarded as one of the safest places to do like field work that's out there in the Middle East. So that's just what I've always heard and assumed. Turkey is also pretty safe, but Turkish government has been extremely difficult about giving permits and being able to work with them. So um, people are kind of looking to Jordan as one of the places that's not too difficult to do. And from the study abroad and the travel sides, uh, we are currently allowing, as a university, students to go to Jordan. I think Turkey was had some restrictions in the past, so if we decided to send students to Turkey, we'd probably have to have some review of that through the travel risk side. So Thank you. There, there is a risk management and travel management committee, which is sort of coming to life right now. The, the official policy by the the sort of emergency operations committee was no international travel. In fact, a lot of people are doing it uh, on their own. The university won't uh, refund you. So we're trying to get that relaxed and a committee is coming to life now. There's been a lot of pressure from different sides, which has helped. So uh, there's gonna be a meeting about that actually next week. Uh, hopefully uh, selected travel will be allowed starting uh, early next year, uh, if not even at the end of this year. So thank you, Marie, for Great. posing the question, and, and to Dan and, and, and Salam and Rick for uh, responding. So that concludes uh, our- Rick, oh, can I just Mrs. add, just bringing back to another pro or another advantage of virtual exchange, you don't have to, you don't have this problem. <laughs> you can bypass this list, so. Good reminder, Rocio. Um, so this concludes our first panel. Thank you to all the presenters once again. Uh, please join me in thanking them. Um, and let's move on to our second part of our symposium. And I would like to invite Ula Berg and Soledad Alvarez Velasco to present on their project, please. Thank you, Rick and everyone else for um, inviting us to uh, share our project here today. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, a research project and that turned into a virtual exchange opportunity. Uh, it's a project titled COVID-19 and Immobility in the Americas. So uh, this project uh, emerged uh, not as a teaching opportunity at first, but uh, as an initiative by several colleagues um, of mine uh, and spearheaded by my colleague Soledad Alvarez Velasco from the University of Houston. Um, migration scholars across the Americas who were very concerned uh, with what was happening to the populations that we studied and we decided to do this joint project where we could monitor and gather information about how COVID has impacted migrant and refugee uh, populations uh, in the Western Hemisphere, so across the Americas. And the idea of our site, which you're all invited to check out, I included the link here and I will post it in the chat shortly, is to uh, highlight and share information on the impact of COVID-19 on a population in mobility or in migrant and um, refugee populations. So our current goal, uh, now that this project has taken off, we currently have uh, over 60 collaborators, researchers in different countries, um, uh, in more than 19 countries actually from many different universities, uh, the project have started to grow in a way that we didn't anticipate when we first uh, set out on this endeavor. Um, and our current goal, and that's what we're gonna talk about today, is to create a course around the project, putting the digital archive that we have created to work um, for teaching purposes. So uh, the title of the course that we're planning for spring uh, 21, is titled COVID-19 and Immobility in the Americas. It's gonna be a 200 level course uh, and we'll do it as a collaboration between uh, the Com Department of Comparative Cultural Studies at the University of Houston and uh, Latino and Caribbean Studies here at Rutgers. And the way that we'll do it is that uh, we'll do it synchronous uh, once a week where students meet in the same Zoom uh, at Houston and at Rutgers. And then we have the second class of the week will be asynchronous where students will work uh, maybe in group. We haven't 
figured that out yet, but asynchronously, uh, not with the whole class uh, and complete certain tasks. So uh, we have been working uh, with uh, Rutgers Global and uh, with uh, Dina and others, uh, Will Pagan, uh, to uh, develop the uh, learning goals and outcomes for the course. And one thing, because we recently decided that we were going to do this, we uh, had to light a fire under our seat to uh, get it on the schedule. And I'm teaching it at Rutgers uh, as a course that I already had on the schedule, focusing on migration, luckily. Uh, that course is also in the core. So one of the interesting things about creating the joint learning goals and outcomes was also to adapt uh, the course that we're proposing to some restrictions that was already existing uh, on the course numbers. So when you look at the learning goals, there are some more traditional academic uh, core goals that are adapted to uh, this topical content. So for example, the first one, we're saying that students will uh, assess and explain the relationship among assumptions, um, methods, uh, evidence, arguments, and theory in social and historical analysis of contemporary migratory and refugee movements taking place across the Americas, including the causes that triggered those movements and their social and economic and cultural political consequences. Students will also apply concepts about human and social behavior to particular questions or situations around the impacts of COVID-19 on um, migrant and refugee populations they will compare migrant state and social movement responses across national and regional content uh, contexts. And finally, they will collaborate to create uh, digital content for online humanities and social science projects like this one. And I'll talk uh, in just a minute about what those activities might look like. Next slide, please. Uh, so since we started with uh, the project and the archive and then tried to think about how we could turn this productively into a course, uh, then the core materials from the course uh, come from the archive of the immobilities uh, in the Americas and COVID-19 project. Uh, the way that we have organized the website, and you can see it's uh, behind me here, uh, there's a <laughs> Uh, screenshot. Um, we have uh, country reports on COVID and migration for each of the participating countries that are generated by the participating scholars. We will use those. We have analysis of some common scenarios also generated by participating scholars and we're currently reorganizing those scenarios into a different, um, with a different topical logic. Uh, we also have migrant and asylum seekers testimonies uh, under the tab that is called polyphonic mapping, where we have uh, researchers across uh, the Americas have been able to work with their interlocutors and have them send us testimonies uh, about how situation looks at, uh, look, the situation looks like at particular borders in the region or in migrant neighborhoods, and we have uploaded those to the site with permission. We will also uh, use, of course, policy and legal documents and investigative journalism report. And then we will use uh, the video archive of the past events that we have had on the site. And Soledad will talk about that just in a moment. We will also, uh, because it's an ongoing project and we organize symposiums, panel uh, talks, uh, um, throughout the fall and also spring, these uh, talks will, the one that have passed already will be available on the site as an archive and those that are happening in the spring, students will be able to attend those as part of, um, of uh, the course. So some of the challenges and lessons learned so far, because we were asked to talk about that. Uh, I think some, someone, I think it was Maite who said uh, the time differences, uh, that's a key thing. Uh, and also different class periods and combination days at different universities, because we're committed to doing this synchronously. Uh, it was uh, a little bit of a scheduling uh, puzzle to be able to find a time and class period and combination date at Rutgers that could fit with the University of Houston. 
Um, it was also a bit of a challenge to figure out how we could um, adapt the learning goals of the online environment and virtual exchange opportunity to uh, the goals that were in the course uh, already since we are uh, using existing course numbers. Uh, and then potential issues that we haven't yet figured out because we, we are just setting this up now is also how do you merge two different institutional rosters, for example, on one course site, because we want to be able to use the same course site. And we haven't uh, figured that out yet. And we'll probably hit you up for uh, some technical assistance at some point uh, soon. Uh, but we have had very productive uh, conversations with uh, both Rutgers Global and teaching and learning uh, so far in helping us develop uh, and discuss uh, this opportunity. Uh, so some of the future activities and goals uh, that could emerge from this uh, is that we will you now we're using ourselves as guinea pigs uh, for uh, how we can teach around this project. Uh, but our idea is also to uh, use the lessons that we learn and the materials that we will curate for our own course to curate free teaching modules on our site that can be adopted uh, in their entirety or just for a couple of classes by uh, um, professors at other universities. We also hope to have those uh, bilingual or trilingual because we have collaborators in Brazil uh, as well uh, as Spanish speaking America. The co-teaching could be expanded to other collaborating uh, scholars and institutions that are affiliated with the project. And as I said before, we have a long list of people located in 19 different countries across the Americas. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that we're also hoping to scale up the project uh, that includes uh, reorganizing the way that we do content management uh, on the site, currently in the process of uh, applying for grants to do that. So the scaling up involves both how we present the content and the research, but also how we can expand the educational opportunity. This is an obvious um, project that could include, uh, not now we're doing the collaboration between two universities in the US, but that have a large international student body. Um, but it could also be Rutgers with uh, a university in Ecuador or in Colombia or in any of the collaborating um, uh, countries that we have. Last slide, please. And Soledad, I think you're here. Do you want to chime in also? Just super quick. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi, uh, good, good afternoon already. So yes, it's super, um, we're super excited of uh, coming up with this joint course and it's part of this big project. And Azula was telling you early before, so far we've done a couple of events that are part of this uh, big aim that we have to build up this digital ar archive regarding the mobility and control tension that is taking place now in the continent. So. We have done two really, really good, uh, we call them conversatorios, which are virtual discussions in a modality of dialogues between uh, five of our research, the, of the researchers that are part of our team, five in terms that one uh, represent each of the regions. So they are, they ha we have a, a space in which we have a very comparative perspective of what's going on in the region. We had the first one, it was um, last August, about border control and hyper-surveillance. And yesterday we had another one really good about the politics of data and the politicizations of data around in mobility and control. Um, these uh, conversatorios are recorded, the video is part of the website, and uh, part of that we are producing a document regarding the main discussions. So we think that both of that, this information will allow us to have more material to teach. At the end of next month, we'll do the third conversatorio about fear as a form of control. Um, so that's another part. Also, um, October 15th, you are already invited to join us. We'll have the launch event 
um, of the mobility projects in English. Uh, it's directed to the English speaking audience. There you, you see our flyer. Uh, it's a conversation about an, a project under construction and we're gonna discuss around the main findings of what we have done so far. And uh, October 26th, we are going to launch this really interesting part of our, uh, it's not only the website, but it's part of our commitment as researchers, which is to bring the voices of immigrants and refugees to discuss with us. So it will be the launch of the Mapeo Polifonico, as we have named it, which, which gathers a really, really interesting, deep and powerful um, testimonies about how migrants across the Americas are dealing with the pandemic. And the last thing is, ah, of course, we also have the launch of the same of our project in Portuguese. So that's interesting because we think that for students, it would be nice to um, move into these three uh, languages that in which we already have produced so much, so much, so much thing and so many different topics and discussions. We have 19 teams in different countries that are already, some of them, they're already working with their own students and we foreseen future exchanges as Ula said. So we are really happy and we will, we're looking forward to, to teach together. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias Ula and Soledad. Um, so we began our faculty presentations with our newer colleagues. So it's really fitting that we have Kyle Farmbury from SPA to wrap up this panel. Kyle? Great, thank you very much. Um, we can go ahead and, and start the slides. Okay, thank you. So this is actually going to be um, a little bit brief um, in comparison to some of my colleagues' um, presentations, largely because um, uh, this, this sort of set of projects is relatively new. In fact, we just had a, um, a major launch event on uh, Monday um, for um, the separate known as the US South African Higher Education Network. Um, we, um, in collaboration with the University of Pretoria, just received a, um, a half million dollar grant to, um, to help to build um, this network that's been in development for a few years. And there are a few components for our project um, that are, are based on some virtual partnerships. Next slide, please. So let me just give you a quick background on, um, on the network. Um, it was founded in um, April, 2016. Um, during a meeting um, that was at the South African Embassy in Washington, D.C., where the um, Minister of Higher Education visited um, and was interested in trying to build a conversation on different types of partnerships between U.S. and South African institutions of higher education. Um, so a number of people at the meeting decided to come together and sort of formalize um, a partnership that would be able to promote these ideas of, of collaborations. Um, about a year later, the Ministry of Higher Education provided um, a sizable grant to a number of universities to look at partnerships in the area of doctoral pipeline building. Um, one of the major concerns in South Africa is around um, the, the need to try to increase the number of people with PhDs, particularly from um, historically underrepresented communities in, in South Africa. So, um, so we've had um, sort of a project under the network really focusing on trying to build collaborations to, uh, to increase the number of, of people with PhDs there. Um, two years ago, the U.S. Embassy provided a small award to look at exchanges in um, areas of university commercialization and tech transfer. And then, um, as I just mentioned, um, we just collaboratively received um, another award from the embassy um, for further partnership building. Um, next slide, please. There are um, three areas that, um, that we're focused on for this sort of new project, um, and, or three areas that are focused particularly in the area of, um, of partnership building that has um, some sort of a virtual component. First is um, some early work around virtual exchanges around mathematics education. Um, when we first pitched the idea, um, the virtual wasn't a big piece um, of this, but of course we're in a very different world than we were um, back in, in January. Um, but the idea behind this is to try to find ways that we can get students in both the US and in South Africa to spend time looking at improving the mathematics, um, I guess, score rates for students who are at the elementary um, and high school levels. 
um, in many of the schools, particularly those in, in many of the township communities in South Africa, there are some real concerns about math um, proficiency of, of students. So the idea ultimately is to try to find a way to, um, to have students engaged in exchange programs where they can work with um, sort of tutoring and helping um, students in their mathematics um, performance. Um, in a virtual world, um, we've had to pivot a little bit and think about how we might um, develop a program that will build in virtual components. So right now we're looking at sort of three phases. Um, one is an is a, um, exchange that will be purely virtual that will engage students in South Africa and in the U.S. and looking at um, sort of promising practices um, in increasing mathematics um, skills. Um, one um, sort of additional is looking at um, primarily virtual where there might be a short-term exchange. Um, so spending most of the semester and then maybe finding a week or two when, um, when we can have a team of students that would go over and, and work with some of the students um, in a live setting. And then ultimately we'd like to um, have a non-virtual um, setting when we're able to, to have um, you know, longer, um, longer exchanges. The second area um, here is around partnerships in entrepreneurial education, entrepreneurial development. Um, trying to find ways that we can get students who are interested in both traditional entrepreneurship and then also social entrepreneurship to, um, to engage in virtual exchange um, and collaborations, um, both around issues of entrepreneurial education, but also to find ways that they can work with local entrepreneurs who might have a particular business that they're interested in developing and embedding. Um, and then the last is building on some of this doctoral training and pipeline on um, building um, collaboration. So as I mentioned, we have about two years of history um, in this doctoral pipeline effort. Um, we've already had a number of in-person meetings, and now we're trying to find ways to move those to, um, to virtual um, settings. One of the things that, um, that we've been finding, and this sort of I would put in the, in the challenges category, is that as we're looking at partnerships around doctoral pipeline building, um, with, with institutions in South Africa. One of the, um, the biggest issues is that they work on a, a very different um, doctoral model than we tend to have in many US institutions. So whereas we tend to have a year or two of coursework, um, they follow more of a sort of British model where people start um, you know, on a day one of starting their doctoral programs, they're diving into, into their research. Um, we um, are batting around the idea of trying to develop um, virtual um, seminars or virtual colloquia or um, ways to perhaps build in um, you know, a period where students um, in both countries can have um, some sort of an intensive um, sort of exchange online um, as a way to sort of help to prep people to go further into, uh, into the dissertation phase. But again, this is sort of still in the earlier stages of, of design and development. Um, this project is, is a, it's a two-year grant. Um, and as I mentioned, um, we just did our sort of public announcement two days ago. So I'm hoping that, um, that at next year's forum, I'll have a little bit more to report in terms of uh, things that, that we've been able to, uh, to achieve in year one. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Kyle. Uh, we have a few minutes now for Q&A, so uh, before we move on to our third panel. So I would like to invite the audience to raise your hands and pose questions for Ula, Soledad, and Kyle. To begin, maybe I can ask Ula, maybe you can say a bit more about um, the launch event in a couple of weeks and some of your additional plans in terms of, you know, uh, one of the questions from the last, uh, last panel was really how do you like work with particular partners and identify the right partners since you have so many collaborators, how, what is your kind of process for prioritizing uh, the, the partners that you think would be more, most receptive to the, the modules that you and Soledad are, are preparing? Thank you, Rick. Uh, yeah, the, the interesting thing about um, both about scaling up a project like, like this and trying to anchor it in, in an institution is that it is, uh, in a way, a very unruly project. Uh, so in that sense, it works uh, a lot like a grassroots movement where people who are taking the initiative to do things make it happen. Uh, so sometimes uh, we have uh, collaborators, for example, the event that we just had that Soledad was mentioning in Colombia uh, was an event that was organized almost in its entirety uh, by the Colombian team. Um, 
who had uh, gotten uh, a journalist to uh, do the moderation and they had conceptualized, the our Colombian colleagues had conceptualized uh, the conversation. So we want the project to remain open uh, to a great deal of autonomy uh, in the different national teams, but uh, it is a lot. Uh, we also want to honor um, the community that we have created uh, around the project uh, so that we can both do events that are organized by Soledad and myself and kind of our, our steering committee group. Um, but we also want to uh, continue uh, with this grassroots model. So we do envision that, uh, that there could be a potential collaboration, both South-South, uh, say, for example, between our partners in Ecuador and Brazil uh, or Colombia and Argentina um, or uh, Canada and Chile, uh, if we want to take the two uh, extremes on, on the continent. But, um, and those initiatives would not have to involve neither Soledad or myself at all. They could be set up, but we hope uh, that the modules that we're creating will also uh, kind of serve as an inspiration. Uh, and we do plan to talk to other uh, people in our network or in, uh, in of our colleagues to kind of incentivate and inspire them also to uh, do some of these um, uh, uh, teaching collaborations as well. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Soledad, do you have anything to add? Maybe just um, in, in the same line that Ula was talking, we also envision collective editorial projects. Now that we have like the first uh, real good findings about the, this comparative perspective, we have find a lot of um, common situations that are taking place across the Americas. And we think that trying to build up uh, not only the conversatorios, but also um, writing pieces, uh, perhaps academic uh, articles, that would be one idea, but also a joint book, uh, trilingual. We, we need to do a trilingual because we are uh, speaking to the, um, the Americas as a transnational um, space. So that's the, 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 that's a challenge that we also have. And, and we also think that we could do it uh, in this spirit of a grassroots movement towards writing. But this is something that we have been discussing with Ula. How do we turn this uh, first phase of our project into uh, an editorial project? Maybe around uh, next spring, the end of next spring could be the moment. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to invite the audience, are there any questions uh, as, as in particular for what Kyle presented as well? If not, I have a question for Kyle. So what we presented is like two very different models of kind of what we're calling non-traditional and obviously uh, non-traditional in the sense of for Ula and Soledad because Soledad is currently at the University of Houston, so it's domestic, but also uh, 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 different in the sense that they're teaching an undergraduate course where Kyle, what you're proposing is a far more extensive kind of curricular change in a kind of a pipeline doctoral program. Can you share with us some of the challenges that you anticipate or some of the opportunities as well? Just elaborate on some of your points as well, because this is a really huge lift that you're, you're, you're trying to address. Yeah, so, um, so we're realizing that, um, you know, that there, there's always sort of um, the challenge of meeting um, the goal with the, the reality and sometimes working mm -hmm. across different bureaucracies as you're doing so. Um, so um, there are um, 26 public universities um, in South Africa and our network basically includes each of those 26 um, public universities and also dozens of universities here on the US side. Um, so one of the biggest um, challenges is sort of to get the systems to talk with each other. Um, and I know that a few of um, you know, the colleagues on the, on the, um, on the um, web meeting have talked about um, going after joint funding. Um, and on the one hand, that's something that we tend to get very excited about. It's always exciting when it comes together. But then um, to think about getting the financial and legal systems between institutions, particularly when we're talking about institutions in different countries to work together, 
Um, so there, there are pieces of that, of that that make it um, a little bit challenging from the programmatic side. Um, I think that also um, we're all very new um, in this area of learning in a virtual space. Um, and um, I think everybody is very excited about the possibilities um, when you're working with partners as we are um, in um, a country where um, the question of computer access and web access, or in some cases, um, electricity access um, is not always a given, um, then you have to be very creative about how you build um, some of the different systems and how you think about things like asynchronous versus synchronous learning that might, might take place. Um, because not everybody's gonna be able to get on at the same time. And um, you know, you're not always guaranteed that everybody's gonna have power um, at the same time. Great, thank you so much. And for that reminder that you know, we have to be mindful of not only time differences, but also access to different kinds of resources as well. So please join me in thanking our panelists, Ula, uh, Soledad and Kyle for their presentations. And now it's time to move on to our final segment of the symposium, uh, where the Rutgers Global Team will be presenting additional opportunities and resources. So first I would like to call on my colleague, Joanna Bernstein, excuse me, <clears throat> Joanna. Thank you. I'm not just a slide advancer. So what I would like uh, to talk about is the Mandela Washington Fellowship Alumni Database, um, which is something that we house here at Rutgers Global. So for those of you who aren't really familiar with the program, um, it's funded by the US State Department. It's the flagship program of the Young African Leadership Initiative, if you know anything about that which uh, brings young African professionals to the US, um, to US host universities all across the nation uh, to participate in leadership institutes. These are six week institutes in business, civic engagement and public management. Um, Rutgers has been involved in this program since its inception in 2014. And we actually have two institutes uh, that come to Rutgers, uh, one in business and one in civic engagement. So as a result of that, uh, we now actually have 250 alumni fellows all across Africa and um, who have participated in the institutes at Rutgers specifically. And we, we consider them part of the Rutgers family. So we decided to start a database to, primarily to keep track of them, but also to give access to the faculty and staff um, who may want to interact uh, with them for one reason, for one reason or another. Um, so what you see on the left-hand side of this of this slide is what the database looks like uh, at the top left. the The web address is at the um, is at the top, and we can share it in the chat. It's pretty easy to find on the global website. Um, in order to access the database, database you have to log in with a Net ID um, through the central authentication system, and it's really meant uh, for faculty and staff. Um, and then once you log in, you get a window that will, it's, it gives you different search um, window uh, uh, fields that you can use. Um, and for example, you can search by Cameroon to see how many fellows that we had in, in Cameroon. So my, why might you wanna do this? So there's a lot of reasons, but I'm gonna give you one example. Um, Janice Sotokoff from Rutgers Newark uh, was teaching a class, a class actually here at, in New Brunswick um, called the Anthropology of Africa. She was teaching this spring 2020. And she, even before COVID uh, hit, she had thought about changing her final project for this class um, because she wasn't really happy with the way her students were presenting their PowerPoints. It didn't seem like they were really engaging with the um, principles of the class. So she contacted us to ask if she could contact some of the Mandela Fellows who might be interested in um, perhaps uh, being interviewed by the students so that rather than having PowerPoint presentations as her final project, they would do videos. Um, so we helped uh, Janice figure out which fellows would be the best one. The, the search fields are not, uh, currently, the search fields on the database are not that intuitive. You have to know a lot about the Mandela program in order to use it properly, and we plan to be changing that soon. Um, but in the meantime, um, 
either me or Greg Costales, who's also um, uh, in the programs team at Rutgers Global, can help kind of navigate the system with you. Um, so we had a set of uh, fellows that we, uh, we gave the list to Janice and she gave them to the students and they all communicated um, with the fellows themselves and created these videos about different aspects of the projects they were working on. Um, I'm not going to show you any of the videos. You can contact Janice to, you know, see some of them. Some of them are actually really, really great. Um, the students really did an amazing job. Uh, the benefit of this is that they were actually practicing skills that anthropologists need, um, such as learning how to interview people, um, which they weren't doing before. And in future iterations of this class, she is going to keep doing this. So this may have helped her out during COVID, but she's keeping it and it worked out better than, it, than if the students had been in person showing PowerPoint slides. So that's all I'm gonna say about the database. Uh, for now, I'm happy to answer questions about it or about the program, and now I'm going to turn it over to Lauren Williams. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, briefly about global museum programming opportunities. Uh, Rutgers Global has partnerships with international universities that have world-class museums and museum educators. Uh, some of our partners include the University of St. Andrews in the UK, the University of Hong Kong, and the University of Melbourne in Australia. Uh, museum education programs enable object-based teaching that supports different learning styles and offers active and experiential learning opportunities. It also facilitates interdisciplinary learning. Students can be challenged to observe and interpret how different cultural backgrounds can influence experiences of the same artwork or cultural object. Um, so programming possibilities can include lectures and seminars on collections, museum tours, and workshops by museum professionals. Uh, because we have existing relationships with these institutions, Rutgers Global can connect you to museums that match your areas of interest to assist in developing programming for Rutgers student audiences. Um, Joanna, can you do the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, so here's an example of this type of programming from the Ian Potter Museum of Art at the University of Melbourne, uh, which collaborates on curriculum engagement with its mental health nursing program. Uh, their students participate in two immersive museum experiences each semester. Uh, the first provides students with a safe space for expl explicating observation, interpretation, and cultural experience through visual observation and interpretation skills. Uh, the second challenges students to explore meaning making, creativity, and core values in a mental health uh, nursing setting. These activities train students in a setting that encourages them to consider cultural context in their observations. Uh, we hope to bring similar museum learning opportunities to Rutgers students, and we'd like to invite uh, faculty to collaborate with us. So please get in touch with us if you're interested in this type of uh, programming for your coursework in the future. Um, so I'm going to hand it off next to Lauren Marigali Ferrer. I think I'll take that, Lauren. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> uh, thank you, Lauren Williams and Joanna. So um, I'm going to be uh, uh, speaking about three additional resources that Rutgers Global can provide assistance with. Uh, again, uh, Joanna has also ta uh, talked about the Mandela Washington Alumni Database, but we're also interested in providing support for any kind of virtual speaker. So if any faculty have ideas about you want to invite a, a, a speaker to come speak to your class, please reach out to us and to me in particular. Uh, and our goal would be to not only uh, have the, uh, the speaker be in your class, but also if there's a, an appropriate time to also plan a larger programming event that we can certainly do that as well. Uh, the other resource I want to mention as well is Rutgers is a member of the SUNY COIL Center's Global Partner Network. So we're, we're able to help you partner with, uh, find matching partners with, with our own current partners, uh, but also within the, uh, the SUNY COIL uh, Global Partner Network as well. The third resource that I want to share with you is that we will be launching the GCEL Course Development Grant which will, which will be included as part of the suite of Rutgers Global Grants. So please keep a lookout for that uh, opportunity in the future. And right now I would like to call on my colleague, Lauren Marigali Ferrer to show us, uh, to share some additional resources. Yep. 
Um, hello, everyone. Uh, the last uh, item that I wanted to talk to you about um, shifts a little bit from faculty focus to student focus. Um, one of the things that uh, Rutgers Global Study Abroad this semester had launched is our online global internship opportunities for students. So we were thinking about ways to make the classroom more interactive for students, ways to tap into career readiness skills, um, and so we really looked uh, to our expansive partner network inside of study abroad to find these internship opportunities for students. So these internships that we are now offering uh, for the spring um, will be in partnership with um, some study abroad providers. They offer a course in addition to the internship itself. The course, again, is geared around um, workplace readiness, how to navigate this virtual workspace that now students are under, um, how to work on the core competencies for career readiness, uh, establishing cross-cultural skills and communication skills and things like that that they need in order to be successful. Um, we've developed a web page and a um, and program brochure pages for all of these opportunities that we are offering to students. And most of the opportunities that we have for this spring semester will land a student at about three credits for their coursework. So this will be in addition to what they're currently taking for the spring semester. So this is a really good opportunity for them to add on and add career skills um, in their, their second semester. Um, and then I also wanted to share um, our home base, the G-Cell home base. So I'm going to ask Joanna to pull up um, the website that we've created um, for the Global Collaborative Education Lab. So all of the opportunities that we've shared today um, land somewhere in one of our four sets of boxes um, here. Uh, we've had lots of faculty speak about the development of courses with university partners, and we're adding a little bit more information on how to get in touch with us, how to start one yourself. Um, Rick just shared about the finding a virtual speaker or guest lecture opportunity. So we put more information about that there. What I also shared, you can scroll down a little bit more, Joanna, is our internship opportunities as well for students. Lauren Williams shared a little bit about the Global Museum Tours. So we really wanted to design a home base for this lab for our, our, our project here for the G-Cell. Um, and we hope that you use this along with this symposium that we've put together today for you to share with your colleagues, get everybody interested um, in these international opportunities in these new and more dynamic spaces now that we're virtual a little bit more. So thank you. And I will pass the mic over to um, uh, Dr. Dan Waite, who is our Director of Study Abroad to uh, conclude the symposium. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Uh, uh, before Dan, I'm, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I also want to just give a few minutes uh, for the audience if there are any questions for the resources we just shared, Dan, before you speak. So uh, a couple of minutes to everyone. If you have any questions, please raise them. Uh, we can certainly try and answer them now. Or if there's any other thick gaps that you've noticed that you think that we can provide support for, please also suggest them. All right. So we did a good job. We are comprehensive. So Dan, on to you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I know when you, I'm the, by the way, the director of Rutgers Global Study Abroad. And uh, thank you again to everyone. Uh, this has been uh, such a fascinating conversation. Um, I know typically when you might think of uh, study abroad, we just think of, of putting students on airplanes, but actually our, our mission in, in Rutgers Global Study Abroad is to make global learning opportunities uh, relevant and accessible to all Rutgers students. And there's many ways to do that that go beyond uh, travel. And I'm just, I'm immensely heartened by the conversation today because, you know, I think traditionally international education has been, uh, you know, a very, can be very classroom centric um, in terms of the home campus, can be very travel centric in terms of what happens outside of the home campus. Um, and it can also be very um, US centered as well. But part of what I see, you know, emerging in this um, otherwise disheartening COVID um, era is uh, really a blossoming of some creative, uh, more creative ways. And I think 
it's not just that we're being more creative, but I think we're shaping things that are, are more uh, reciprocal, are more equitable in terms of their access to students. Um, so, you know, just to some of the trends that I heard even uh, listening to everyone today, um, I love the fact that we're talking about global pro problem solving, um, Ula and Soledad, or among many others that, that kind of are using a, a project-based learning and global pro problem solving approach. Um, you know, I love that so many of these integrate research, um, that so many of what uh, has been talked about today really increases equity and addresses equity and increases access because we're um, talking about models that, um, particularly the virtual ones, that don't require the high cost of, of travel. Um, we're talking about models that, to me, feel more reciprocal and that we're really um, equally get, giving our partners equal time and it's not just about us um, and, and, and being US-centered again. Um, innovative models of language learning that take it outside of the traditional language classroom, which I think is, is fantastic. And, um, you know, global local learning, which I heard some as well. Uh, just so many different alternatives to getting students on airplanes. So again, it's very heartening. And it's, it's not that we're abandoning our traditional uh, travel-based models or even what we do in the classroom. I just feel like what I'm hearing is those are going to be more and more integrated. And so the intersection between traditional models of exchange and study abroad with these new models we're de uh, developing, um, that's what I'm excited about. Um, so just, you know, as we wrap up, certainly want to, to um, thank everyone, uh, Rick Lee and, and the whole team for putting this together. And please do know that um, we're here to be your resources, uh, your, you know, to offer our resources, um, even if it's just a conversation, the, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a, a, a formal meeting, but we're happy at any time to just talk about, hear your ideas and, uh, you know, offer some of our own to, to explore potential areas of collaboration um, and to, you know, enter this brave new world of what are things going to be like post-COVID. So thank you again, everyone uh, uh, who's been a part of the conversation today. Thank you, Dan, and thank you to all our presenters, to the Rutgers Global Team, and to all of our attendees for taking time to join us today. Again, we will be posting the recording of the video on our Rutgers Global YouTube channel, as well as uploading the presenter's PowerPoint presentations on the Rutgers Global website. So please keep a lookout on those. And we look very much forward to working with all of you in designing some additional virtual exchange opportunities. So please reach out with some ideas. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon.